<coughs> Do you want to borrow this? I think it's okay. You're going to bellow into it? I can it. bellow. <coughs> I think it's, it's it, it is on. It's on. All right, good. <laughs> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our uh, scheduled speaker for this afternoon, uh, Tomasa Freo, has had a family emergency and is unable to make it here today. But we're very lucky that at extremely short notice, like a few hours, um, our own Phil Marshall has stepped up to give this. Um, Phil is, is a great replacement for Tommaso. He's a senior staff member at SIC where he has a number of important jobs. For example, he's the Deputy Director for Operations for LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is a lot of work. He has just stopped being, very recently, the spokesperson for the LSST uh, Dark Energy Science Collaboration. That was a lot of work. Um, he's broadly interested in many aspects of astronomy, and cosmology, um, including applications of advanced uh, statistical methods, and teaches <coughs> 366 here on campus. If you don't know about that course, haven't taken it yet, uh, do take a look. Uh, uh, Phil, I knew Phil as a grad student uh, in uh, Cambridge, uh, where he got his PhD in 2003. Uh, he then uh, set a path for me. He led the way by being one of our inaugural uh, fellows, postdoctoral fellows in Quebec, and I followed him here because it just looked too exciting not to come. He then went up to uh, Santa Barbara and then to become a university research fellow, a uh, Royal Society University research fellow in Oxford, before we were lucky enough to be able to tempt him back uh, uh, to SLAP about five years ago. Um, Phil, thank you so much for stepping up at the last minute to tell us all about this hint of new physics. All right, thank you. <coughs> oh. All right, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, sorry for, uh, to all of you who are expecting a jolly Italian astronomer. Uh, you get a slightly sarcastic British one instead. <laughs> okay, so uh, Tommaso uh, wanted to talk to you about um, a particular issue in uh, uh, physics. It started out as a as an issue in astronomy, and it's become an issue in physics, hence the colloquium today. Um, tension between early and late universe, hint of new physics. Uh, what he's talking about here is the, the Hubble constant. Um, so you may have heard about this uh, on the grapevine. This is uh, uh, something uh, going on in cosmology that uh, has risen to the level where all of us as physicists, I think, should be paying attention to this. Um, so tension is a good word. Should make you think of uh, uh, elastic strings that have been stretched. There's quite a lot of uh, elastic potential energy st uh, stored there. Uh, we might expect some of that potential energy to be emitted in the form of um, papers written by theoretical physicists. Um, and so, partly this talk is to uh, get some of you uh, theorists uh, excited about some possibilities, but also to show you uh, some of the things that you need to be aware of in terms of the measurements that the astronomers are making. So that's the, the idea behind this talk, I think. So what are we going to do? Uh, first, we'll take a look at um, what this tension is in the Hubble constant measurements and uh, what meaning it has for, for cosmology. Uh, there's a number of different ways to measure the Hubble constant. Um, and in particular, you can try and um, uh, make measurements in the early universe and make predictions about the Hubble constant in the, uh, the late time universe, the one we live in. Um, but you can also try and measure the Hubble constant in the local universe itself, and it's between those two regimes that the tension lies. So we'll take a look at, uh, at some of the measurements involved. Um, the, uh, uh, not the bulk of this talk, but certainly a significant amount of this talk, I want to tell you a bit about um, the way that uh, we measure the Hubble constant here at KIPAC at Stanford, um, using uh, strong gravitational lenses. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with Tommaso for, uh, for many years now. And in fact, uh, even before that, I was doing it with Roger Blanford when I first got here uh, to Stanford. So this is a, a long running uh, research interest of mine. And it's interesting because it's, um, uh, it's quite different in character to, to the other methods that I'll show you, as, as you'll see. OK, and then towards the end, we'll look at what we're going to do about this, this tension. Uh, what can we do on the measurement side? and um, the, some of the exciting things that um, the theorists uh, should be thinking about. Okay, so the Hubble constant. You've probably seen this plot before from the 1920s. Uh, this is um, measurements of the recession, the apparent recession velocity of galaxies against the distance of those galaxies from us. 
Uh, it was hard to make this plot. The difficult bit, the most difficult bit, uh, was measuring the distance to the galaxies. Um, here, they're uh, uh, a little bit off um, from the actual distances that we now understand. But here, uh, Edwin Hubble could already see uh, the trend, which is that galaxies that are further away from us seem to be moving away from us at higher speeds. And so this is what you expect in a uniformly expanding universe. If you think uh, about a fruitcake uh, or plum pudding rising in an oven, uh, the little raisins in the dough are all getting further away from each other, and the ones on the edge are expanding away from each other faster than the ones in the middle. And so this is kind of what we're seeing here, only galaxies instead of raisins, and space-time instead of dough. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the Hubble constant. Uh, why is it interesting? It basically quantifies the current rate of expansion of the universe. Uh, and it sets the scale for uh, all distance measurements in cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, so there's a lot of astronomers uh, here at Stanford that um, are interested in the Hubble constant in as much as they want to understand the actual distance to things in the universe. And to, to know the actual distance to something, you need to know what the Hubble constant is. Okay, so <coughs> here's a plot of measurements of the Hubble constant uh, over time. You see publication year along the x-axis increasing to the right. And you can see that since 2000, uh, we've been improving our precision, precision of measurements of the Hubble constant. And here in blue, there are measurements by uh, a group called Shoes. And they're, they're making measurements in the local universe. I'll explain in a second. And then in red, you see people who are trying to make predictions of the Hubble constant in the local universe using data from the co uh, cosmic microwave background. That's the, the red points. And so you can see uh, when the error bars were, were big and everything was imprecise, everyone was happy, concordance, cosmology, everything agreed. And as precision has improved over time, we've started to see this divergence between the two types of measurement until here we are uh, uh, somewhere off to the right of this plot uh, with some significant disagreement between the, the two measurements. So that's the tension that, that's in the title uh, between those two measurements. Actually, interestingly, this plot doesn't show measurements of the Hubble constant before 2000. Um, what that would have looked like, uh, if we ignore the 1920s when uh, we were off by an order of magnitude, for a long time there was disagreement between whether the Hubble constant was 50 in its units uh, or 100. And the same thing happened. There was divergence between uh, the people who were me making measurements saying it was 50, people making measurements saying it was 100. And those measurements became significantly different. There was tension in the past as well. So keep that in mind when listening to and thinking about um, new physics. The resolution of that previous tension was to improve the measurements and reduce systematic errors. OK, so now here we are uh, right now as of this summer. Here's a plot that was made at a workshop in July down at um, uh, our sister institute in Santa Barbara, uh, KITP. And it has a number of new things on it, including measurements not only from the shoes group, but other groups working uh, with similar types of uh, measurements in the local universe. And um, compared with uh, measurements of the Hubble constant or predictions of the Hubble constant coming from, uh, from the early universe. And so, uh, the, dos the dashed line at the top here makes some uh, rough distinction between uh, me predictions of the Hubble constant that depend on our understanding and measurements of the universe at redshift of 1,000, that is the era of recombination when the, uh, the CMB radiation was uh, emitted, and these uh, measurements at redshift 0 to 1 that we're uh, calling the, the late-time universe. Okay, so why is this interesting, this tension that we, that we see in our, uh, in our current measurements? Well, mainly it's interesting because uh, if these measurements are, are right, they're suggesting that Lambda CDM, uh, our sort of standard model for cosmology that we've been all working with for the last um, 10 years or more, is not a sufficient description of the universe. So there's been solutions been, uh, been proposed for resolving this tension, uh, but nothing has emerged that clearly explains the, the tension without breaking other constraints. Uh, this is interesting. Um, turns out there's not much room in the theory to, um, to fiddle with the cosmological physics uh, after recombination, so the focus right now in theory is, is on pre-recombination physics. 
unless, of course, we have systematic errors. But this point is important in the last year. There would have to be systematic errors in multiple measurements in order for this not to be a real tension. That's why we're excited about this uh, now rather than last year or the year before, is that we have multiple measurements that all, all disagree with the early time measurements. Okay, so let's look at some of, the, some of these early universe measurements, try and understand what's going on. So, you can um, uh, constrain or predict the present day value of the Hubble constant from uh, the cosmic microwave background data. How does this work? Well, the position of the first peak in this famous plot that you've all uh, seen many times is the CMB temperature power spectrum. The position of that first peak depends on the um, sound horizon at last scattering. That is um, essentially the, the, the largest distance that sound waves in the uh, ionized plasma could have traveled um, before uh, recombination and then um, emission of the CMB light. So if the sound horizon was, was different, this peak would, would move to the, to the left or the right. And as you can see, to predict the, the value of this physical distance in the early universe, um, it's an uh, integral over redshift that just depends on um, some uh, small number of cosmological parameters, particularly the Hubble function, but also the, uh, the density of ordinary matter and, um, and photons at the time. So if the cosmological model wasn't simple lambda CDM but was something different, you'd have a more complicated uh, integral in this, but you'd still be able to predict the sound horizon and then, and then uh, compare it to measurements of the position of the first peak. Okay, that same sound horizon um, features in predictions for similar oscillations, not in ionized plasma in the early universe, but in the density of galaxies in the late time universe. So these same uh, oscillations that um, give rise to the CMB power spectrum uh, turn up later imprinted in the clustering of galaxies in so-called baryonic acoustic oscillations. And so we can measure those uh, at redshifts around 0.5 or so. Uh, this has been done by uh, uh, groups like uh, BOSS and is currently now, as of this week, being done with DESI, a very interesting experiment uh, you should find out about. And so you can um, take the consistent predictions from the CMB and from BAO and use that to also um, uh, get a better measurement of, of the Hubble constant or a better prediction of the Hubble constant in the present day. Okay, so that's how CMB and BAO tell us about uh, H0. In the late universe, um, we can try and measure the Hubble constant uh, more directly by looking at the distance and speeds of things uh, in similar ways to Hubble originally did in the 20s. Uh, we just have more things that we can use now, not just galaxies. So many of these methods uh, use something we call the, the distance ladder. Uh, why is it called the distance ladder? We were supposed to imagine stepping out through the universe, each step being um, a measurement made with a new astrophysical probe, uh, but that depends on um, the steps that you took underneath, or the rails of the ladder. So, in order to get out into the so-called Hubble flow, where we really are seeing the expansion of the universe, you have to use these things called uh, Type 1a supernovae, uh, whose relationship between luminosity and uh, uh, distance we think we understand. Um, to get out to there, we need to study galaxies that contain both supernovae and something else that we can link down to the local universe. So what do we uh, use there? We use, um, for example, Cepheid stars, whose luminosity and period are correlated. And so we can use the fact that they're correlated to, to tell us something about the, the relative distance of that, uh, of that galaxy. And then the closest rung to us, the one that actually matters most, um, uh, is the uh, um, stars or Cepheid stars <coughs> in the Large Magellanic Cloud for which we have parallax measurements. So we start with an absolute distance from um, astronomical parallax and then use that to calibrate the relationship between period and luminosity in Cepheids and then go looking for Cepheids in external galaxies and then find those galaxies that contain supernovae and then find more galaxies even further away that contain supernovae and build up this uh, distance ladder where we think we know uh, the distance to these distant galaxies. Okay, so here's words that uh, repeat all of that. Um, the, the bit about using Cepheids, turns out we can use other stars. We don't just need Cepheids. Cepheids are very good, 
but there are other stars we can use as well. We can use stars that lie at the tip of the red giant branch. We can use those as distance indicators. We can also use um, uh, Myra variable stars uh, in a similar way as well. Um, until recently, the measurements with these other types of stars hadn't been very good. That changed this summer, hence the excitement about the tension. Okay, so here's some more plots uh, showing you that the tension is there. This is a plot made by the group that are working mainly on Hubble Space Telescope observations of Cepheids in other galaxies and building up um, steps along the distance out of this way. And so this is a group called uh, Shoes, led by um, Adam Rees. And here's a plot showing that they, uh, you see the, the red point here that says here, uh, that's the, the, work, the latest work from the Shoes collaboration. And you're supposed to admire the tension between that point, which disagrees with the CMB and BAO points on the left-hand side. Actually, one interesting thing about this plot, you see the, the red points. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. They all seem to agree with each other. Some of that is because um, there's a big overlap between the data that went into those points. So you have to be a bit careful when, when reading these papers, looking at these, these plots, to look for which data sets are actually independent of each other, statistically independent. So you can see there's, uh, there's a point on here, R16, that's labeled shoes. Some of the system, some of the Cepheids that are in that paper also appear in the more recent one. Okay, so the same shoes collaboration started looking at Myra variables and uh, put out their first measurement uh, this time. And you can see here in purple, uh, measurements of the Hubble constant using a distance ladder that can t that's made of Myra variables gives uh, pretty much the same answer as a, a distance ladder that was made using Cepheid variables. Those are the blue points at the top. So, are these uh, independent data sets? Uh, not quite. I mean, one, there's a couple of ways that they're correlated. Uh, some, uh, well, they all use the same bottom rung of the ladder. They also use uh, some overlap in galaxies that contain both Myras and Cepheids. And then there's a third way in which they're correlated, which is that the, it was the same team doing the analysis. So another thing to watch out for is who's doing the work and are they taking steps to make sure that the results that they put out are, um, are accurate? And so just to note that the Myra, the Myra study here was done by the Shoes team. Okay, here's a different group of people led by Wendy Friedman down in um, Pasadena using uh, tip of the red giant branch uh, stars. Uh, they're the ones in red here and overlaid on um, a version of the plot I showed before which has the, um, the CMB measurements now in black and the Cepheid measurements now in blue, again as a function of year of publication. And you can see here the um, tip of the red giant branch measurements started out safely in the middle and have sort of stayed in the middle while getting more and more precise, which is uh, an interesting trajectory. <coughs> okay, one of the problems that the, uh, that the shoes group found when trying to do the tip of the red giant branch uh, themselves, um, they found uh, problems with uh, dust. They had to put in some effort to correct for uh, uh, dust absorption in their measurements. Um, I only flag this up just as an example of one of many systematic errors that, uh, that affect all of these measurements. Okay, here's something else that's a bit new. So rather than trying to step up um, a distance ladder that we've made from parallax measurements and then Cepheids or Myras or tip of the red giant branch and then supernovae. You can instead try and make measurements of distance in the universe um, to objects whose precession velocity you know. Uh, you can try and do that with um, systems that have physical models where if you know, use that physical model to tell you what the physical size of it is or the physical luminosity of it is, you can then use its apparent size or apparent brightness uh, to tell you how far away it is. So standard supernovae type 1a are standard candles. Turns out uh, mega mazes are something like uh, standard rulers, or perhaps um, standard rulers that are sort of spinning in a standard way. Okay, so this is what they look like. Uh, mega maser is uh, um, bright clumps of molecular gas in orbit around the center of their galaxy. Uh, here's a schematic for some um, gas clouds in, in orbit around the center of NGC 4258, uh, which is a CFERT 2 galaxy for the spotters in the audience. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, molecular uh, emission 
coherent molecular emission from, from gas in orbit around this, uh, the center of this galaxy. And so if you uh, look at these little triangles representing clumps of gas in orbit around the center in this picture on the left, uh, you can imagine that um, if you have a model for how those gas clouds orbit the, uh, the central mass, you can perhaps, if you have enough measurements of their apparent radial separation and their rotation speed, you can piece together a Keplerian model for the orbits of these things and get a handle on how big physically this thing is. And you can compare that with how big it appears to be on the sky. So that geometric modeling allows us to, to get at uh, the physical distance to these systems. Now, these mega mazes are rare. We only know of a few of them. But you can see they're very valuable. They give you a, a physical distance in the universe. So it turns out now uh, we have four of these systems uh, with measured uh, distances and hence, um, comparing with the redshifts to these galaxies, uh, estimates of the Hubble constant. And you can see these here in blue. So each Hubble constant me measurement is sort of 10% uh, or better and then combining, um, they're getting down to uh, several percent precision, which is enough to be competitive with the other methods. So mega mazes have become one of our, of our tools as well. And they're interesting because they're, they don't depend on, uh, on the di distance ladder. In fact, so, in fact, some distance ladders depend on the, these. But they're interesting because they're they give us physical distances. OK, so I'm a big fan of physical distances. Uh, the other way we can get physical distances in the universe um, is by making physical models for the mass distribution in gravitational lenses. So it's a similar idea to the mega mazes. Instead of a Keplerian rotation model telling us the absolute size of something, we're going to use uh, a model for the mass distribution in a galaxy to uh, tell us essentially the physical size of that galaxy. Actually, it's a bit more, uh, the distance we get is a bit different from that. Um, so I'll explain. Uh, I think this is supposed to be a movie, but I don't know how to make it play. Uh, but there's a picture taken by uh, Yasha Hezeve, who was a postdoc here for, for several years with, with Roger. Um, what you're supposed to notice is that when you look down the corner of this fish tank, you can sort of see that the, the weed on the left-hand side, you see it on the right-hand side as well. You see that? So there's multiple imaging of this uh, uh, object in the fish tank. Uh, because of the bending of light as, as, it come, as the rays come out of the fish tank and back into your eye. So it turns out that the universe does this uh, not only in fish tanks, but also uh, with massive galaxies. So here's a, a <coughs> much more boring picture that we put in a review um, showing the Huygens construction for gravitational lensing. You've got the background source on the right. That's the blue galaxy emitting uh, blue light. And then um, you can sort of see maybe if you squint hard enough, that there are two paths for rays to take um, that uh, have the same uh, Fermat uh, time, so both are paths that the light travels, uh, but maybe you can see by the time the light arrives at you on the left-hand side, there's a little delay between wave fronts for one of the paths relative to the other. Shouldn't be surprised about this because the paths are different physical length around the galaxy, but it turns out as important as the uh, physical path length difference, there's actually a, uh, a difference in effective refractive index for these two rays. So the one, the rays going closer to the center of the, the foreground galaxy, the orange blob, uh, experience a different refractive index than the ones outside, and so arrive at um, delayed time because of that as well. Okay, so in practice, what this means is that we can measure a time delay flickering AGN source in the background, you measure the two images of that AGN either side of a deflector galaxy, and you see the flickerings but with some offset in time. So we can measure the time delays, they're typically a few days to a few weeks. And then we want to compare those measured time delays with predictions from a physical model. That physical model um, includes uh, the so-called time delay distance to that galaxy. It's a mixture of the distance to the galaxy and the distance to the source behind the galaxy. Um, but it turns out that that distance um, has the units of distance and depends on uh, H0 like this. So the steps are, first you measure the time delay. It's hard, you have to, you have to monitor these lenses for several years, uh, for lensed AGN. 
Uh, then you have to model the um, lens potential, the projected gravitational potential. Uh, explain more about how we do that. Uh, then you can combine the two uh, to get the time delay distance and then use that um, uh, in a Hubble diagram-like way to infer cosmological parameters. All right, so <coughs> there's some history to this. Uh, this was first proposed by um, Sjur Refstal in 1964. Uh, this was before the first gravitational lens was discovered. That was 1979. Uh, first lens quasars are seen on the sky. Um, then people started to try and measure time delays and constrain H0. Uh, first, it didn't work, uh, basically because we weren't good enough at, at measuring the time delay. We didn't have well enough sampled light curves. Turns out it's um, uh, a lot of work, a lot of monitoring to get a good time delay. Uh, but then we've, we realized uh, we got to a point where we had good time delays. We tried again to measure Hubble constants in the 90s. Um, then the problem was we didn't have good enough mass models. We had good time delays, but not good mass models. So we needed to make better mass models. How did we make better mass models? We needed better information about the lensing effect of the, of the deflector galaxy. And the big uh, advance was using Hubble Space Telescope to image the systems deeply enough that you see not only the AGN, pair of AGN, but you also see the Einstein ring of light from the host galaxy of the AGN. And it's that Einstein ring that contains all the information about the mass distribution of the lens. So we needed HST observations and good software, uh, modeling software to, to cope with it. So by about 2010, we'd got, got it all together well enough to make our first um, uh, seven percent measurement of distance from a single lens. Uh, that was uh, work that Sherry Suyu led while she was a student here at Kaipak. Uh, since then we've been adding to the sample. Um, here we have just joined us uh, Simon Bira has joined us as Cavley Fellow. He's uh, leading the way making uh, new and better measurements of um, uh, Hubble constant from uh, our current HST data and you should talk with him and also Jiwon Park about um, ways to measure uh, better and better ways to measure H0 with um, upcoming data. Okay, so modern time delay cosmography. How well do we do right now? Well, we can measure time delays to a couple of percent. This takes, as I say, years of monitoring and careful, uh, careful analysis. I think tenacious is a good word uh, from Tommaso here. Um, we also need to be very good at astrometry, particularly for these Einstein rings. And in practice, that means high resolution, high signal to noise imaging. Um, Typically, so far, Hubble or, or in the radio, but we're starting to use adaptive optics more and more. Um, we can get the <coughs> lens potential to a couple of percent. It requires not only doing this Einstein ring modeling, but also measuring the dynamics of the, of the stars in the lens galaxy and combining the two. And then it turns out we need to account not only for the mass in the lens, but also all the mass in the universe between us and the lens and also between the lens and the source. So we have to somehow account for all that weak gravitational lensing that happens along the line of sight. So there's a, uh, there's a lot involved. Uh, extremely interesting measurement problems all over the place. Um, and uh, certainly worth um, some interesting problems to think about. So uh, here's just some examples of the data we're working with. Here's um, monitoring data for uh, one of our lenses. Um, you can see here uh, seven seasons, I think, uh, collected by the Cosmograil team using a network of small telescopes to measure the changing optical brightness of the system. Uh, here's an example of um, uh, reconstructing the mass distribution of the lens. Not showing you any pictures of the, of the reconstructed mass here, but rather showing you that we're good at modeling the data by showing you the observed image on the left and the predicted image on the right. Or maybe it's the other way around, I forget. Uh, wait, hard, to, hard to tell, isn't it? Okay, so combining with um, stellar kinematics, we, we can do uh, uh, pretty well at getting physical mass models for these lenses, at least at the level we need to be competitive in measuring H0 now. Okay, one thing that, that we do, um, so Simon and Tommaso and I are in a collaboration called um, Holy Cow, which stands for uh, H0 from lenses in the Cosmograil wellspring. Uh, one thing we do in the Holy Cow group is uh, we try and do our analysis blind. Um, what does that mean? It means we are not allowed to look at our measurement of the Hubble constant until everyone in the team agrees that we've finished analyzing all the systematic errors properly. And so in practice, what that means is um, a lot of time spent analyzing the systematics and also multiple telecons where people are 
uh, unsure enough to say, yes, we can unblind yet. Uh, it also means that we have to agree to only use the same plotting software. We're only allowed to look at plots of H0 relative to some offset. Uh, we usually show deviations from zero rather than the actual value of H0. And we're not allowed to look at the value that we get until everyone agrees. Why do we do this? The worry is that if we didn't do this, we might stop analyzing our systematic errors too soon. Why would we stop too soon? Well, if we thought we had the right answer, we might stop. What's the right answer? Well, the right answer might be the one that agrees with everyone else. So if we're particularly interested in tension between measurements, it's quite important to take these steps to stop yourself, uh, stop yourself from fooling yourselves about the answer. So when you're reading these papers, you should watch out for who's doing their analysis blind, who isn't. Uh, okay, here's another example. I don't think I've shown you a picture of a lens yet. Here's a, a very nice lens, uh, DES J0408. The DES stands for Dark Energy Survey. Lots of people at KAIPAC involved in this um, uh, very exciting survey of the sky that's uh, just finished taking uh, imaging data, but it's, we're still analyzing the results. So this is a, a system that was analyzed by uh, Simon Tomaso and their grad student, Anawa, down in, in uh, UCLA. Uh, you can see they do an excellent job measuring the, uh, reconstructing the mass distribution. Um, how do you know that? You see where it says normalized residuals and they all look like noise. That's what you want them to look like. Okay, you don't need, we don't need to go through this plot. But what you're seeing here is different choices in how the model is set up um, to look for sensitivity in the results, the H0 measurements, to these different choices. And the thing you should take away is the, that the contours are overlapping with each other, which is to say the measurements of distance in this system are stable relative to uh, choices in your, uh, in your modeling. So all of these methods require uh, models to be made of the systems we're studying. And whenever you make a model, you have no choice but to make assumptions. The best you can do is test those assumptions uh, against each other. Okay, so here's where we were earlier in the year. This is um, six lenses in the holy cow sample. Here they are on the left-hand side. And here are their um, posterior PDFs for H0 from each lens analyzed individually. So we make this plot to, to check that internally we, um, uh, we agree. Each one of these measurements, except for the red one, was made blind. The first one we ever did, we didn't blind ourselves. Everyone after that has been blind. And so we've, we've been on the lookout for have we been systematically agreeing with ourselves from our first analysis, and I don't think we have. We have a, um, the kind of scatter between measurements that you would expect given the width of the PDF. Okay, so <coughs> what, is, what does it mean? The H0 that we get from combining our um, six lenses together, uh, what does it mean in terms of cosmological model? So the, the black curves here, dashed and dotted, those are the um, uh, the constraints on cosmological parameters we get from the strong lenses on their own. The gray uh, bananas are what you get from the Planck CMB measurement. So the interesting thing here is that they, they don't overlap well. Right? There is tension between uh, uh, Planck CMB and the, the six uh, strong lenses. And the reason these, these um, uh, uh, let's see, this one is what I wanted to show you. Here we see the, the same um, tension evident, but now instead of the sort of standard lambda CDM cosmological parameters, which are on the previous slide, now we've thrown in some, some new parameters that aren't in lambda CDM to see whether including those can um, uh, mitigate some of this tension. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have um, neutrino species in our cosmological model for predicting distances and so on. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the, the sum of the masses of the three neutrinos in the model. And you can see that there is some degeneracy with, with H0, and that the, um, the lower masses bring you better in, into better agreement with the, with the strong lenses, but not enough to make the contours overlap. On the right-hand side, we have not only uh, neutrinos in the universe, uh, with um, unknown masses, but we also have an, un an effective unknown number of species. So three plus something else, where something else is something new. Um, and so here you can see that uh, if you have the effective number of neutrino species be higher, that would allow um, 
that would bring the CMB and the strong lens measurements into better agreement. But you can still see in the top panel that it's not, um, it's not solving all of the tension. But this is an example of the kind of thing that, um, that the theoretical physicists are now looking at as possible solutions to this tension problem. Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, with the seventh lens, uh, it again agrees with the others, which is good. Okay, so bringing all, all that uh, together for the lenses, um, we, uh, we see something like almost six sigma worth of disagreement. What does this mean? Uh, the sigma here is the quadrature sum of the uncertainty on the CMB measurements and the uncertainty on the, from the seven lenses. And so this is um, uh, a pretty significant result. Certainly enough to make a particle physicist uh, sit up and pay attention. Okay, so now if we look back at one of the plots I showed you earlier in this talk, uh, more tension, uh, hopefully building in the room. Um, what you're seeing here is a, an interesting check. This, um, this slew of points underneath the dashed line um, are showing different combinations of these late universe probes. So the lenses, the Cepheids, the tip of the red giant branch stars, the Myra stars. And because we haven't yet got to the point where we can combine these rigorously taking into account the, um, the correlations between these measurements. Remember I said they weren't statistically independent. What we can do is, is do um, tests like um, uh, leave one out jackknife or something where you, where you look at the combination of a subset of the measurements and check that the, that is still in tension with the CMB. And so that's what you're seeing here. There's a, a bunch of different um, jackknife separations of the, light, of the late time measurements. And we consistently see uh, tension with the, with the early universe measurements. Okay, so how do we solve this? I showed you some um, unconvincing plots that neutrinos were the answer. Uh, here are some other plots uh, that maybe give us some pointers as to what might solve the problem. So this plot is showing the um, uh, H0 on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the uh, sound horizon, physical um, uh, sound horizon size in megaparsecs. This is uh, uh, a recombination era quantity. And what you're supposed to see here is that for um, Lambda CDM, the prediction is the, the black contours up there. But you can see the prediction from the late universe measurements, that is, shoes and holy cow. These are these, gre these gray blobs, which is to say that the late time universe measurements seem to prefer a smaller uh, sound horizon at recombination. Now, how to reconcile these two things. Basically, you'd need a, a, a cosmological model where something fairly exciting happened just before the era of recombina recombination, such that you could make predictions about the CMB power spectrum that agreed with the eventual uh, universe, as it turns out, at, at redshift um, one and below. And so possibilities for this are um, some new relativistic particle that affects the dynamics of the expansion just in this narrow window before recombination. Uh, another alternative are uh, models called early dark energy, which do something similar. Um, and so, uh, strangely, these seem to be uh, uh, near the top of the list of uh, plausible explanations if this is new physics. Uh, here's another, uh, 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 another uh, sort of take on this. Uh, this is a nice plot from um, uh, a quite an interesting paper by Knox and, and Malaya at UC Davis where they're trying to illustrate how the uh, early late universe constraints on H0, which is the orange band from shoes in this case, and the um, BAO and type 1A supernova results in the, gray, in the green band, it's very hard to make them agree, both of them agree with um, the standard Lambda CDM model and the Planck data. And so this paper, um, I put up the figure because it's, uh, it's interesting to think more about. But if you take one um, reading assignment away from this talk, if you're that interested in it that you want to find out more, I recommend this paper by Knox and Malaya. They basically, they're, um, they're theoretical physicists, and they go through all the possible new physics explanations um, in some rigorous detail and assess which ones they think are plausible, which ones they're not which ones are not, and their conclusion is more or less uh, 
the an increased expansion rate just before recombination is the is maybe the best thing to focus on. But it's a very nicely written paper. It's called the Hubble Hunter's Guide, which I think is a, a good thing to provide to uh, theorists before they start writing uh, lots of papers. Okay, so uh, what's next in this field? What are we going to do next? Well. <coughs> While the theorists uh, do their thinking and come up with thing ways to explain these, these measurements, clearly there's more stuff for us to do on the measurement side. I uh, tried to hint at this uh, already. Basically, what we need um, is uh, a set of methods here to compare against each other to give us cross-checks that are each equally precise. So each one of these um, probes of the Hubble constant is going to need to uh, improve in precision to keep up with the rest. And while improving with precision, that means you have to control your systematic errors to, uh, uh, to the right level in order to realize that precision. So for example, uh, Gaia will improve the parallax for the local distance ladder. That will help um, with both uh, precision and accuracy. Uh, I like the way here Tommaso says, time will provide more supernovae. Uh, I guess from his point of view, they just, uh, they just appear. Um, <laughs> But in all of them, systematic errors need to be tested, including here um, by data challenges. Um, we're fans in this sort of lensing community um, of doing data challenges. Why is that? Basically, it's because we're interested uh, in what other groups make of the same data that we've been analyzed, we've been analyzing, uh, to try and make sure that the assumptions we've been making um, aren't uh, driving the result. We'd like to see other groups be able to, to get uh, similar results. Um, I think that's the main reason why. Okay, so for time delays in particular, how are we going to get to 1% um, precision or to keep, keep up with everyone else? Um, three things. Basically, we need to keep working on the systematics um, in new and inventive ways. Uh, it's good to get better precision per system and then um, the last refuge of the scoundrel is to just get more systems and combine them together. So Tomato says 30 to 40 needed here. As you'll see in a minute, there's, there's potential to do uh, many, many more than that. Okay, so um, <coughs> I mentioned data challenges as a way of, uh, of uh, checking for systematics. Uh, it's worth um, doing ongoing checks of, for correlations between our measurements of H0 and other properties of our system. It would be weird if we saw that all the most distant lenses gave high H0 and all the, the, um, the closer ones gave low H0, for example. Um, we can also work on uh, improving the precision per system. Here's an interesting uh, prediction from Anwar Shajib, who will be visiting Kaipak uh, later this, this fall. Uh, he's looking into how much information is available um, from uh, next generation telescopes measurements of the speeds of stars in these deflector galaxies. So I said we need to measure the dynamics of stars. Uh, it would be even better if we could measure the dynamics of stars in a map across the deflector galaxy to really understand the mass distribution well. Turns out it's too hard to do that with Keck adaptive optics uh, and there isn't a suitable spectrograph on HST and so we're looking ahead to extremely large telescopes to give us this spatially resolved spectroscopy uh, that we need to, make, to take the next step in lens modeling. Okay, improving statistics, uh, how to get more systems. Um, uh, we expect to find a lot of interesting gravitational lenses with LSST. Uh, in fact, it's why I'm here uh, working on LSST. That's how I got interested in the first place. Um, here's some, uh, um, a gallery of lensed quasars found in um, the Dark Energy Survey, which is not so different from LSST, um, except LSST will be four times the area, uh, significantly deeper, and give us... Um, time domain information, so the monitoring we need for time delays, as well as the, uh, the kinds of images that you see here. So there's potential with LSST to find um, thousands of lenses. Um, I think a thousand quads uh, might be a, a, an upper limit. Uh, certainly we expect to be able to measure well uh, hundreds of um, lensed AGN and hundreds of lensed supernovae, which we didn't even talk about today, but you can imagine how good lens supernovae are for measuring time delays. You see the explosion once and then you see it again. Uh, a few weeks later. Okay, so all of the, uh, to make really good measurements, uh, we're going to need uh, 
uh, high resolution imaging for all these systems, um, as well as spatially resolved spectroscopy. And so this, this begins to look more and more like a, a large program on an extremely large telescope. So we're following the progress of TMT and EELT and telescopes like that um, with great interest. Okay, so I've shown you <laughs> in multiple versions of the same plot that there's around a five sigma tension between the early and late time measurements of the Hubble constant, or if you prefer, the predictions for the Hubble constant from the CMB and the measurements of H0 in the local universe from Cepheid stars, Myra stars, tip of the red giant stars, mega masers, and strong gravitational lenses. Uh, it's interesting that we now have five different methods of comparable precision and they agree with each other and disagree with the CMB predictions. And so it's beginning to, to feel like this is a real tension. And so it's interesting to think about the new physics that might be required to, to explain that, going beyond Lambda CDM. Uh, and so I think I'll leave you with this slide and happy to answer questions uh, to the extent that I can. Thank you. Well, as you probably know, two weeks ago, a paper came out uh, in which Gaia uh, looked at wide binary companions of Cepheids in our galaxy and uh, deduced the Hubble constant in agreement with the early universe numbers, 68 to 69. Mm -hmm. The paper was later withdrawn, but the abstract still exists. <laughs> uh, what's your opinion of this? I think... I think if that results, ho result holds up, then it pushes us much more towards thinking about systematic errors in, in any of or probably most of these probes. And so the theorists listening should be watching out for that kind of thing and kind of holding, holding off beginning to write stuff. <laughs> Because if, that, if it is true that there are late time measurements that um, agree with the CMB, don't agree with the thing, and they have been done blind and they are robust and et cetera, et cetera, then that suggests that our problem is systematic errors in the measurement, not in new physics. Yeah. The, the tricky thing is, though, that there'll be a whole mess of different measurement systematics to, to try and understand. And so it will be worth putting some thought as a community into how to, to go through that process. Because the risk is that people will see that um, result and then think, oh, we're back to Lambda CDM, and then there'll be a, potentially a tendency back towards convergence on, and so then we're back in the, you know. So we have, to, we have to be a bit careful. We have to not give up the, um, the results we have so far in the, that were done very carefully. If we're going to be going back and reassessing the systematics in each one, we have to do it quite carefully. And I would say blindness is as important in that scenario as it is when you're looking for new physics. How important is the tension between the Cepheid and the Tipper Great Giants measurement? That, that, that lies right in the middle, yeah. And new physics will not help that. Yeah, so it's kind of in the same category as, 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 as the example Bob gave. Whereas Bob's was more local universe measurement, definitely agrees with CMB measurement. Tip of the Red Giant branch from Friedman et al. Is, is more in the middle. And it's interesting that the Shoes group, when they tried to use the same probe, found something, uh, Hubble constant, that's higher. So, the worry is or well, one worry you might have with a measurement that lies right in the middle is, does the team have an unconscious tendency towards diplomacy? Like, <laughs> and so, in, and I mean, it's again, it's another case where you, where you want to be blind and worrying hard about the systematics because it could well be that your, your um, unconscious bias is towards stopping analyzing the systematics early when you think you have the right answer. So. That's certainly the thing that first came to my mind when I saw that, that, that result right in the middle. Actually, I had the same thought when looking at um, the first attempt to measure the Hubble constant using standard sirens. So the gravitational waves group were trying to use um, the first uh, gravitational wave source as a, as a distance probe in the universe. And they showed a plot in their paper that has the, the PDF for H0 that has a peak exactly in agreement with <laughs> 
with the, uh, with the other late universe probes, even though it, it's very much broader. And so the question is, right, did they stop analyzing their systematics too early because they got a result that agreed with the previous ones? So I think just in general, we have to be asking that question of any analysis we see. Is there some possibility for, for bias creeping in? Um, you said the time delay is measured uh, between the two paths, and the delay is in the order of days to weeks, and so they measured to about 100% accuracy. Why is that? What's, what's the difference? Sorry, what's the question? What's what, the accuracy of measuring that delay? What limits the accuracy of the time delay measurement? Um, basically, the sampling of, of, um, of observations that you can, you can make. So the best time delays we have are um, several weeks in duration, and the absolute uncertainty on that time delay is around one to two days. And one to two days is, is about the frequency of monitoring that you can orchestrate. And why is that? We're basically limited by our ownership of the telescope that does the monitoring. If we own the telescopes, we could be pointing at the lens multiple times a night, every night, when it wasn't cloudy, and we could do better. But even, you know, the weather gets in the way, and it's hard to do um, faster sampling. Now, we have tried doing um, measuring time delays in a different regime, looking at very short time delays, and doing rapid monitoring within a night. And that has some potential, I think. It's quite a difficult measurement to do because the, the, the variability isn't uh, necessarily as, as strong, but it's worth looking at, especially when you have a large number uh, that you want to follow up and you may not have the ability to spend weeks or years following up individual lenses. But basically, we're limited by the, the time sampling and the monitoring. Yeah, I think the I think the reason the BAO measurements get get are getting lumped together with the CMB measurements here and, and labeled early universe is because of this dependence on the sound horizon. That to interpret the measurements and and hence infer cosmological parameters, you have to go through the sound horizon. And that's the thing that appears in both. Um, but that's physics, it's not data. That's right, that's right. So the, so the measurements themselves are independent, but the, the model that you use to interpret them is necessarily the same. So what that means is that if the solution to this apparent problem is new physics, it's going to require a, a model that is able to predict both the CMB and the BAO and the late time H0 in a self consistent way. Yeah. Any final questions? If not, then let's thank them. There we go. I hope that was okay. It was perfect. It was very, very good.